we scope out orthopedics. Coming next, On Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. When you see an athlete run, turn and jump to catch a ball thrown by another athlete 30 yards away, it boggles your mind to think of the precision with which the bones, joints, muscles, and tendons all work together in a perfect harmony. It rivals that of any doo-wop group of the 60s. Most of us never attain that level of co coordination, but we still need to walk and move through our daily lives. Orthopedic surgery helps us to keep the abilities we need. To help answer all of your questions about bones, joints, muscles, and tendons tonight, I'm joined by Dr. Pete Luby and Dr. David Jones, both practicing at the Orthopedic Institute in Sioux Falls. We appreciate you coming here, gentlemen. We answer your questions as they called in and are sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in your questions at 1-888 376-6225 or email us at oncalltv.org. So, Dr. Luby, tell us a little bit about your your practice. You were originally from? Sioux Falls, right. And then you trained at? Well, I did my uh, medical school training at Washington University in St. Louis. I was a resident at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Did my orthopedic sports medicine fellowship at Harvard University in Boston, and then I moved back home with my lovely bride, Catherine. And so you've, you've been here, and you have how many children? We have two. They're in high school down in Sioux Falls, and uh, I've been in practice now 19 years in 19 Sioux Falls. years. Great. And David, tell me a little bit about you. Where are you from originally? I grew up in, Rick, in uh, Platt. Platt. And, uh, so I grew up in a small town. I uh, went did my undergraduate training at uh, Taylor University in Indiana and then moved back this direction, did medical school at uh, Mayo in Rochester, and stayed there for an orthopedic surgery uh, residency, and then stayed another year for a hand and microvascular surgery uh, fellowship. So you're a hand specialist. Yeah. So what we've got is a general orthopedist. This guy does everything. And then we've got the guy who probably does everything, but he also does hand. So we're great. Uh, we're, it's a great pleasure to have you both with us. So what's the, what do you do the most since I did that fellowship in sports medicine, most of my practice, Rick, is reconstruction of the knee and shoulder. I deal with a lot of athletes, and then I do a lot of knee replacement, shoulder replacement, and some hip replacement. Okay. And so uh, everything, really. Hips, knees, not a lot of ankles. No, you know, uh, David and I are very fortunate. We've got an excellent fellowship trained foot and ankle surgeon at OI, Dr. Eric Watson. If I get a difficult ankle case, I'm likely to ask Eric for some help with that. And uh, you, you do shoulders? I do a lot of shoulders, yes, yeah, sir. That's great. And are you complete hand now, Dave? Primarily uh, work from the elbow down. Uh, we all take some general call, and so we, we uh, maintain our skills in those areas, but uh, focus primarily on the upper extremity. So elbow, elbowed on down, not uh, the shoulder, yeah. but some stuff. Uh, I can tell you that uh, as a guy who spent a lot of my time in my life in the emergency room caring for people and, and uh, taking care of people coming in, fractured bones are things that uh, I was happy to give away to one of you guys. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. The study of orthopedics is, uh, the word came from pediatrics. That's correct. What's that story? Ortho means straight and peds means child and so the earliest orthopedic practitioners used a lot of splints and braces to straighten childhood deformities so and that and that's what started that whole subspecialty right but Correct. then you moved into that whole group uh, kind of got in with bone setters. Do you know the history of bone setters, David? Uh, not, not real well. No. Do you, Pete? Well, uh, not specifically, but that in order to straighten a crooked child, we had to develop a great knowledge base in how the musculoskeletal system works, and that has led us to modern orthopedics, Rick, where we are the specialists in abnormalities of the bones and the joints and the muscles and how they function. Yep. And, and was it, I, I, I read where there was for thousands of years, n not doctors, but guys who were known as bone setters. But they were separate from the, the physicians and the surgeons and the, and, and the bone setters uh, joined 
as one bone setter had a dad, a son that went to med school, and suddenly there was this that 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 came together. You know how? Were these bone just, setters were they the same as the dentists? Sort of the same thing, you know. <laughs> so. So now your dad was a doctor. Yeah, Tom Luby, who was an uh, OBGYN specialist in Sioux Falls for 41 years, just retired two years ago this month. And your dad is a doctor. He is. He's a family practice doctor. Still practicing Platt. He is. He's currently in Wisconsin, uh, but practicing Platt for many years. Oh, uh, that's a that. Do you think that had anything to do with your going into that field? Into that field? Maybe a tiny little bit. Yeah, yeah like a little bit. Probably a little bit. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. Uh, my, my, my dad was a mutual fund salesman. <laughs> uh, you know, there was nobody in medicine in my family. I had a judge back there a couple generations. But. So what's the most important things, a uh, couple things that you'd like to make sure that people know? I want you, you know, in the end, when we're done, they, they're going to go, I can take this home, this is new. Uh, David, I mean, yeah, I, hand is... Yeah, one of the problems that I see where I wish people had come in sooner is people uh, that have numbness and tingling in their fingers, nerve problems, where they've got a pinched nerve. Uh, because if there's a nerve that is pinched too long, that can lead to irreversible damage, where even if we do surgery, they don't restore, uh, they don't get back their full function. So what would be the classic? Carpal tunnel, right? Yeah, so the, the classic is uh, your fingers fall asleep, you wake up in the middle of the night and your hand is asleep. you got to shake it out and, uh, or driving or talking on the phone, those sorts of activities. The fingers uh, go numb or fall asleep. So it's mostly the thumb, the first and the second, and it, if it exactly. spares the fourth and the fifth, I mean, yeah, you've got the diagnosis. Exactly. You really don't even need exactly. to do the study. But if you leave it alone too long, then you lose that Function, right? Yeah, not, not just the sensation, but probably more importantly is the muscles at the base of the thumb, uh, which can really impair your hand function. Um, so and so, you put them all in wrist splints first? Yeah, so we, we start with wrist splints. Oftentimes we start with a cortisone injection into the carpal tunnel. For some people, that's curative. That's all they need. Right. Uh, but many times, if, it's, if they've waited, uh, then we end up doing surgery to right. release the nerve. Take home, ma major take home messages. Yeah, so I think David makes an excellent point. What are the things that we wish we saw earlier? Right. And for me, it's the torn rotator cuff. Uh, Rick, you and I have done this together for a yeah. long, long time, and you and you know that if you see a patient that you and I need to be worried about a torn rotator cuff, we need to make that diagnosis early because two, three, four, five, six months down the road, it may not be possible for me to repair that for that patient. So what is the clue that they know that there's a torn rotator cuff? What's the major torn rotator cuff? Yeah, so the, the classic story is there was trauma, patient comes in with shoulder pain, and they've got weakness when you test the rotator cuff. But you and I also know it's not always classic, and so you've got to be suspicious about those torn rotator cuffs or you're going to miss them. So it isn't, it's mostly after the trauma is playing football, or I was lifting at a deal and then suddenly, pop, and then I can't do it, or what's the classic story? I would say in Brookings, South Dakota, the number one story is I slipped on the ice and fell and hit my shoulder, Doc. <laughs> All right, there you go. That's probably, that. <laughs> That's probably the most common story. So, well, we need your questions. So give us a call at 1-888-376-6225. This is your show. We've got experts. This is problems that you're going to commonly run into. I know you all are thinking about questions. Get them in early so we can get to them. 1-888-376-6225. Fractures are a frequent occurrence as we age, but technology is advanced to make dealing with the inner inconveniences a little easier. A bunch of holly blew off my doorways. And of course, when I noticed that in the yard, since there was no snow or ice, I went out the front door to retrieve it, not realizing that the humidity was such there was a thin layer of invisible ice, which I hid immediately. And I fell down all the concrete steps that led to my front door and landed on the sidewalk. When the doctor looked at me, she was pretty sure I'd fractured it, but we had to have x-rays to be certain. And so uh, they kept me pretty much immobilized until the x-rays were back and they confirmed that it was broken. I recommend the scooter over the walker because you don't have to be worrying about walking with one foot and protecting your injury on the scooter. The scooter protects the injury for you. 
it replaces, in some cases, the old plaster of Paris food that we're familiar with seeing. You've perhaps seen athletes hobbling around on this. It's quite a remarkable contraption. Your foot fits into it, and then with a lot of Velcro pieces, you make it fit as close as you can to your own foot. Then you strap yourself in, and on the sides are small devices where you can increase the tightness or decrease it with a little bulb so that you can have an exact fit. And that allows you to have an exact fit at all times because your foot does swell and sometimes it doesn't swell and sometimes it swells a different amount. So this allows it to always be as immobile as the doctor had hoped. You can't feel sorry for yourself in the middle of the night when I wake up and I want to go to the bathroom and I know I have to go through all of this and I have to get on my little scooter and I have to get myself there and I want to think, poor me. I think, you wimp. You say an extra prayer for all those servicemen we have in this country who are, have injuries like this all the time and so much worse and we don't give them enough credit. Mine is only inconvenience and discomfort. There's a real pain in serious injuries. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, th that was the former president of South Dakota State University graciously willing to talk about her injury and indicating, as Pete said in the, in the, during the, the uh, presentation, he said, boy, that lady's been a teacher her whole life, hasn't she? <laughs> so what was the, she was showing mobility. I mean, she was able to stay mobile. She had a scooter. There are a lot of mobility types of devices that are available. <clears throat> Uh, how important is it that people stay mobile after an injury of some kind like that? David? Yeah, I think that's uh, it's one of the areas where we've made some gains in recent years. Uh, previously, historically, fractures were managed with uh, casts or bed rest uh, immobilization, whereas now with some of the newer devices, uh, we attempt to stabilize the bones with uh, structures uh, internally, plates and screws and rods. And uh, so from a hand surgery standpoint, oftentimes we fix wrist fractures and get people moving within a week or two afterwards so that their wrist doesn't stiffen up like it would being in a cast for, uh, for oftentimes a couple months. Uh, well, that, that, that's a, the most important thing post knee surgery, for example, isn't it? That you really get them moving yeah, or, or, exactly. or we'll lose the game and their pain won't go away. What, any comments about mobility? Yeah, it, I think if you compare modern orthopedic surgery with what you would have seen in the 40s and 50s and even the 60s in this country, there's this tremendous emphasis on early motion of joint injuries. Uh, we, when I was 17, 1980, playing football for Lincoln High School, tore my ACL. Uh, Bill Watson, who later on was a partner of mine, uh, maybe oddly, maybe not, operated on me that night to fix my ACL and uh, put me in a cast for eight weeks. It was absolutely horrifying when that cast came off that my knee was bigger in diameter than my thigh, my quadriceps, you know. Because <laughs> that had all gone away. It had all gone away, and the stiffness in that knee was tremendous. I mean, I probably had 20 degrees of motion, you know, I think would just kind of go like this when that cast came off. And so we spent a year getting the flexibility and the strength back into that knee. Now, when I do that operation now, Rick, I have that patient moving in a continuous passive motion, a CPM machine in the recovery room, yeah. literally movement immediately. Yeah. And that made a huge difference in how quickly we can recover. And everybody knows all the pro athletes like Tom Brady, et cetera, who've been back on the court or on the field so quickly after that operation. Yeah, that's, that amazes me how that's changed, hasn't it? Uh, and of course, the lack of movement afterwards. I've seen the people who are afraid to move because it hurts when they don't move, they end up with chronic pain. And they go, what did I do that surgery for? And the answer is, um, that, you know, well, whoops, you needed to get moving and it's your responsibility, not yeah. just the doctor. Yeah, well, and David, I'm sure can speak to this, but the, the, often the rehabilitation after the procedure is more important than the procedure itself. Yeah, yeah. well, 
uh, we, we um, uh, the idea of uh, that scooter. Uh, I've I've not seen too many people until she had that scooter. What other devices do we have? I that's, think that scooter has been a tremendous been improvement. Amazing. You know, all these. Uh, SDSU athletes that I operate on, it seems like they don't go to crutches or a walker anymore. They, they got to have a scooter. a scooter. And it's almost kind of become sort of a competition amongst them. Who's got the coolest scooter to yeah. go the fastest <laughs> on it, you know? Well, I mean, that, that the crutches were the old thing. And uh, those are gone now. A lot easier on the shoulders and elbows and wrists than I right. use the crutches. So. So we have a 55-year-old man from Wagner has scleroderma is wondering if Dr. Jones has ever operated on someone with scleroderma or rheumatoid arthritis to relieve curling of the hands. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I see a lot of people with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, scleroderma isn't as common, but we do see that. Uh, there are other conditions that cause curling of the hands. Uh, Dupuytren's contracture is one that we see a lot of. Talk about that because uh, that's, uh, Dupuytren's is, let's just put a little red marker here. Uh, Dupuytren's is, uh, let me just say, I don't know why I didn't do that. Dupuytren's is generally these two areas. Explain to me what happens. So the, the skin on the palm side of the hand is anchored to the deeper tissue, the, the muscles and the, uh, the tendons here, uh, by a, a dense uh, fibrous tissue. It's like gristle that uh, uh, allows us to grip things in the hands without the skin moving and uh, in some people more common in people of northern European descent that tissue thickens and it begins to act like a winch to pull the fingers down into the palm and uh, commonly it's the ring or the small fingers um, it's generally not painful uh, but it can be quite debilitating we see people where their fingers are all the way in the palm they're just completely uh, closed off and uh, there's several, uh, the gold standard has been surgery, uh, but there are some newer treatments, some injections where we uh, just inject right into that tissue, uh, the joints that are contracted. And uh, there's an enzyme in this injection that helps to dissolve that tissue. So uh, we're leaning towards treating that more non-surgically these right. days. It's not on the tendon, it's the skin over the tendon. Correct, right? it's actually the skin that acts like a, like a winch to pull the finger down. The, the tendon itself, people can still curl the fingers down actively. But uh, How about stretching it? I mean, just constantly stretching, is that a good idea? Uh, that, that's okay, but unfortunately stretching it or splints haven't been shown to be able to stop this process. Mm -hmm. So if it gets to the point that people can't put their hand down on the table, then we start thinking about treating it. Uh, I've been told if, it, if you can't get it in the pocket, pocket. That's another common complaint people have, or getting the, gloves on. But there's, uh, there are procedures for uh, this, these people yeah. and the curling of the hands in particular. Yeah. We have a question. A 19-year-old has severe intermittent pain above each kneecap. What could be the cause? Uh, two things come to mind, Rick. Very common problems around the knee that cause pain, especially in your young athletic population. Um, so if we go to the telestrator here, here's our patella here, and it is uh, anchored uh, above the patella by the quadriceps tendon up here and below by the patellar tendon here. And then on the back side of the kneecap, back on the other side here, is the articular cartilage, the cartilage that covers the back side of the right. kneecap. And any one of these three things, the quadriceps tendon, the patellar tendon or this uh, cartilage on the back side of the kneecap could be causing this pain. Okay, and um, so if this is, this is a person who's 68. 19. Oh, who's 19. Uh, the most likely thing, and he said above the kneecap, would be that, that tendon, number it's one. It's probably the quadriceps tendonitis, and it often is associated with this uh, chondromalacia patella. Okay. What about Osgood Slatter's? That's an old disease. To explain that. Yeah, so Osgood Slatter's disease occurs um, in kids. So you have to have an active growth plate. And what it is, it's a chronic irritation from activity of the growth plate that sits right here where the patellar tendon comes down and attaches to what we call the tibial tubercle. The patellar tendon is constantly pulling on this piece of bone right here, and it will kind of separate it through the growth plate from the rest of the tibia bone. And so these kids get these big knobs on the front of their knee. They're painful, and especially if in sports there's contact there, they can really get a lot of pain there. Wow. And so you take them out of sports for a while. Well, we tend to brace them, decrease their activity, try to decrease their pain. You know, uh, you know how kids are. They're gonna if it doesn't hurt, they're gonna go back to playing, and that's probably good for them. Okay. 
All right. I, that, I love this telestrator thing. This is really <laughs> great. I have a question. 68-year-old uh, man from Al Alcester, how long should I continue with constant knee pain before you recommend knee surgery, bikes regularly, with pain? David, any comments? Yeah, I think uh, staying active is, is key, so if you're able to live your life, uh, that, that's one thing, but obviously you want to be able to do the things that you need to do, and when you can't do those anymore, when the pain is limiting your activities, I think that's the time to start thinking about having surgery or, or seeking other treatments. Sometimes injections can get people by for a while, but okay. it sounds like it's getting close to time to consider it. Good. 75-year-old uh, woman from Winter having knee uh, surgery on Monday. Is it safe at the age of 75 to have this procedure? Are the risks that are com of complications higher? So knee surgery in a 75-year-old woman from Winter, not far from Platt. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think of that, Pete? Well, you know, uh, some of us at 75 look like 55. Some of us at 75 are more like 95. I, you know, it's not exactly how old you are, Rick. As you know, it's kind of what your physiologic age is and, and how healthy you are. And, and how important is this knee surgery to you continue to enjoy your life, you know? So those are the kinds of things that somebody needs to consider. It's certainly true as we get older, the risk of complications from surgery increases for the general population, but you know, I think the oldest person I put a new knee into is 103. Oh, and you put it out. <laughs> she, was, she was remarkably healthy. She had no medical problems, except that she could not walk the way she wanted to because of that pain in her knee. And you know, I had a long conversation with her. I said, I'm not sure this is the right thing for you. And she said, well, I am. Let's get it done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, uh, Lee Cradeville of Brookings, good friend, has been a patient and friend for a very long time. Recently, his knee <clears throat> that he had injured a while ago was getting to the point where it impacted his daily life. I referred him to Dr. Luby, and this is his story from there. Me. And if you have to hold on front here, you can, but I just need to. Trying to document your work here. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> that one's good. Well, Lee, tell me a story. When did these start giving you trouble? Oh, uh, early on 2014. Okay. And mostly it's the left knee. Right. It really, very sharp burning pain right across that quadrant there. Okay. So it is, and it'll wake me up at night. And uh, going downstairs is, I sidestep going downstairs. It's very painful. Well, your x-rays look good. Uh, there's no signs of any severe bone-on-bone -bone osteoarthritis or anything That's like that. Good. You still got well-preserved joint spaces here, so plenty of cartilage in that knee. And at, in mid-60s, without bone-on-bone -bone arthritis and this kind of knee pain, it's almost always a cartilage injury that causes this kind of problem. And when we're examining the knees, we're going to check to see the range of motion. Do you get much pain when I get you bent up there? Yeah, all the way? a little bit. A little yep. bit, yeah. So that's indicative usually of a um, medial meniscal tear. We can oh, go ahead and lay it out to the side here for me now. Good. Now you let me know if I hit a tender spot in here with my thumbs. Right there. Sore there. Yep. So what I'm rubbing on there is the medial meniscus edge, and it's quite tender. I su uh, suspect highly that you've got a tear in there. So when you're 18, that cartilage is really tough, and in order to tear it, it's a car wreck. You fall off the scaffold, or you got a football injury or something like that. You and I aren't 18 anymore. The cartilage is not quite so tough, and you can literally tear it getting in and out of a vehicle, getting out of bed in the morning, getting up from a squatting position on the floor, and usually when it tears, there's no sensation. The meniscus itself doesn't have any nerve endings in it, so you can tear it and you don't feel it. And so the next morning you wake up and your knee's swollen, and you're like, what the heck happened to me yesterday? You know, so that's the usual story. You say your recovery period very quick. It's pretty quick, I traveled yeah. to Alaska in June. Oh yeah, you'll be ready for that, no problem. Okay. The book says 12 weeks. Um, you know, you're physiologically more like 50, you're gonna heal up pretty fast. 50, huh? Geez, I'll have to tell that to my primary <laughs> physician. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's time to cool. A couple more here. Hi. Let's talk about this. So what, what are we doing here, Pete? Uh, so, you know, Lee came in with that knee pain. We did a workup, x-rays, MRI scan confirmed that he did have a torn medial meniscus. We talked about treatment options. He elected to proceed with an arthroscopic treatment of the torn cartilage in that knee. So these are actually images uh, taken of me doing the 
arthroscopic surgery on Lee's knee. You can see we've got the knee draped out here. I'm using some uh, local anesthetic, some Novocaine, to deaden the knee before we do the procedure. He's actually under a light general anesthetic right now, so he's not feeling any of this. We get the scope into the knee. This is a video scope, so we can see the inside of the knee on a TV monitor in the room. So you see me operating on the knee, but I'm not really looking at the knee. I'm looking up at the TV monitor for the images. That light cord right there is what provides light inside the knee so we can see, and you can see the light coming out through the skin there. Our video crew thought that was really cool. <laughs> And then I've inserted a shaving device. We're going to start removing some of the torn and damaged cartilage inside Lee's knee. That's, that's fascinating. So I mean, we've got a tel on Telestrator, we've got some things to, oh, we're going to do video first, apparently. OK, the first clip, let's see this. All right, so here we are looking inside Lee's knee. This is the inside half of the knee, what we call the medial side of the knee. And we've stopped it here to give you an idea, and I think we've got this on the telestrator here now too. So this is a loose or torn piece of articular cartilage that's freely floating around inside the knee. And, and Lee had a variety of things that were wrong with the cartilage inside of the knee, and when they tore, he kicked out a bunch of these loose pieces of uh, cartilage, and we found probably a dozen of these pieces float, free-floating around inside the knee. Now this one in particular looked to me like it had come from the articular cartilage of the medial femoral condyle. You can see there's a little bit of a hole back there that kind of matches up with this piece, and that's probably where that came from. Okay, let's do clip two then. Go ahead and roll the tape. All right, so now, we can see in this clip the torn medial meniscus. So again, we're on the inside half or the medial side of the knee. This is the surface of the medial femoral condyle or the femur, the thigh bone as it comes down and forms the top of the knee joint. On the bottom here is the medial tibial plateau and that's the top of the tibia or the leg bone. So it's right where these two bones meet, that's where the hinge happens in the knee. And in that area is the medial meniscus. And this is the inner edge of that medial meniscus here. And then this thing's got a big tear in it that goes up like that. And then this is all kind of shredded up in here. This is a complex tear of the medial meniscus. And uh, you know the reason this hurts is that these pieces that are torn and loose and moving around in here get caught between the two bones the femur on the top and the tibia on the bottom. And uh, the tolerances inside this knee are such that if you get a loose piece caught between those two bones, it's like somebody stuck you with an ice pick. It doesn't feel good at all. Right, now, I mean, and the whole point is that you've got this set so that it's pulled apart, but when he's walking, they're smushed together. That's exactly right. So we're right. looking at the, uh, an artificial f space that don't, doesn't it Normally does not exist. Normally those surfaces are right up against each other. Okay. So we'll continue the diagnostic arthroscopy here. We've seen the torn medial meniscus there, the articular cartilage damage. Now this is his ACL right here, Rick. Oh. So on this photograph, we're kind of in what we call the notch region. The femur's got this notch in the middle of it where the cruciate ligaments attach, and right. then the tibia is down here on the bottom. And right here in the center, you're looking at his ACL. There's uh, one edge of it, here's the other edge of it. You can see there's a big blood vessel running down through it there. Oh, okay. And uh, you know, we're all aware of these uh, torn ACLs in athletes, but this is an absolutely perfectly normal looking ACL right there. Where does it tear usually? Uh, it, typically in the top half. Usually when we go in, and I just did two ACL reconstructions today, the, the bottom half is almost always well preserved. It tears up in the top half here. It can either tear in the substance or it can tear right off of the femur, right up in there. And right now, how are we fixing those with, with your own tendons? Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of different things you can use to make a new ACL. My preference after 25 years of doing this is the middle third of the patellar tendon that we get from the patient, not out of the bone bank. Okay, oh, good. All right, next clip.
All right, and then this, now we're over on the lateral side. This is the outside half of the knee, and, and I include this mainly to show you what a uh, normal meniscus looks like. And it's not completely normal. You can see that the inner edge of this thing is frayed a little bit in here, but you'll notice that this back third of the meniscus looks very different from his medial meniscus, whereas the medial meniscus had that big tear that was going up like this and it was badly frayed up in here. This lateral meniscus really looks pretty good. He did have a little fraying and tearing of what we call the posterior root of the lateral meniscus. You can see that tear up in there and then he had a little articular cartilage damage down in here and we cleaned all that up for Lee while we were in there. All right, so now we've gone through, we've done our full diagnostic arthroscopy. Now it's time to start doing a little work to help out Lee. And this uh, tool that you see me using here is a motorized shaver. It's about a sixth of an inch in diameter. It's got a, a, a rotating blade and it's attached to suction. And you can see it does a beautiful job of cleaning up that medial femoral condyle where that tear had occurred and that loose piece had gotten shot out into the knee. Okay. Go ahead to the next clip. All right, so now we're going to go back and start cleaning up that torn medial meniscus. I'm going to use the shaver to start with here. You can see it pull in that torn and loose piece and it'll start chewing it away. And all the loose pieces of that then are sucked out or extracted from the joint. So we'll use the shaver to get as much of that material out that's torn as we can. We always, of course, want to leave as much of the healthy tissue in as possible. Now the fluid, we saw a lot of movement going on. That's yeah. because there's a water, it's flushing it. That's exactly right. When we do arthroscopy of a joint like that, we're constantly flushing the joint with fluid. It's coming in through the scope and it's leaving through another portal. And that uh, distends the joint so we can move around without damaging the surfaces. And it makes sure we have a good clean field so we can see what we're doing all the time. Okay. Uh, this is, how long have we been doing this kind of procedure then? Uh, arthroscopy in the United States arrived about the early 70s, so over 40 years now. All right. One more last uh, clip. And then finally, we're going to uh, do a little cleanup here with a little punch biter that I've got here. So some of that tissue I can't get off with the shaver, and we have the series of different little punch biters that we can just trim off the torn pieces. And you can see this thing does a nice job of just taking off the torn stuff, getting back to the good, healthy cartilage back there. And then I think we've got a kind of before and after picture uh, next. Yeah, so there's two images. Okay. Try to get the telestrator to that one so we can kind of just compare and contrast. Yeah. So on the right side here, we've got the, uh, bef uh, the after, and on the left is the before. So you can see the tear in the medial meniscus, the loose piece, the frayed pieces back here, the rough surface on the medial femoral condyle, and then on the after over here, you can see we've smoothed that femoral condyle out, and I've removed the torn and loose pieces from the medial meniscus and cleaned that up. So our next question is, how did it work for Lee? And uh, we have a follow-up with, uh, with Lee coming up. 48. Looking good. Good. That was good, 148. Let's see what this one is. Bring this one up compared to this one. All right, what, what is he doing now? A physical therapist was measuring his range of motion. The physical therapy work on uh, flexibility, range of motion, work on strength, and we work on their function. We want to get their gait back to normal and get them back to their previous level of function. Just what else that they cross over? That's bad. That's bad. That's like ACL tear bad. Oh, okay. So he's getting some good physical therapy, and now we're seeing him play volleyball. <laughs> He's back to probably where he, why he ended up with that meniscus. <laughs> All right, moving pretty well. All right.
thought that was uh, a courageous thing for you to do and a courageous thing for Lee Crowdeville to let us do that. Thank you so much for that. Any comments that you had as an observer of this whole process? Yeah, uh, a bad, bad tear of the cartilage, and uh, I think it shows what, what a good surgery can do in, in helping people stay active and doing what they enjoy doing. So do you think that he'll have more trouble with that knee? If he lives long enough. Isn't that, isn't that the, the answer to that question yeah, always? That yeah. <laughs> if you live long enough, you're going to have trouble with your knees. You know, back when we were all living, the uh, average life expectancy was 35. Nobody outlived their knees. But now the, you and the cardiologists have got to live in us so long yeah. <laughs> uh, that we're outliving our knees. So. Yeah. Thanks for that, that confidence. <laughs> so the, there, is a, there was an article that came out, I think it was in the 80s or not, late 80s or 90s, about too many arthroscopies occurring that it didn't make much difference in the long run. No. You know, and it, mostly it was uh, criticizing it in the elderly population. What's right. your take on, what's your defense on that? Yeah, so that article uh, is uh, very widely known. In fact, it came out when I was in residency and it was- So what uh, year was that? Uh, 90 to 95. Okay. So you were exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, the study was done at a VA institution in the United States where they did uh, essentially sham surgery. They would go in and uh, they'd take uh, knees with arthritis in them and clean them out. You know, I don't know what that meant. They were shaving, cleaning, whatever. And then they took an equal group of people with arthritis in their knees and they just put the cuts on them and they didn't actually do anything. And then they watched these people for two years and it turns out it was exactly the same. This wasn't exactly uh, new information for orthopedic surgeons. We knew long before then you could not effectively treat osteoarthritis with the scope. And, but that wasn't Lee's problem, obviously. Lee's problem is he had a torn meniscus. Right, so there it is. It's a, the, the, all scopes are not bad. <laughs> and, and, you'll, and you'll hear that. And uh, boy, I hear, I hear that from Lee because he is so pleased that he doesn't have that discomfort. And I know it was really bothering him. Um, all right, so we've got questions we should dive into uh, these questions. 62-year-old man from Sioux Falls has issue with finger contortions and cramping. It goes away pretty quickly. He's wondering what this indicates. So he's got a lot of cramping in his, his uh, fingers. Any comment about that, David? Yeah, hard to know exactly what that is. Uh, sometimes these trigger fingers, like we talked about earlier, can cause uh, what feels like cramps to people or catching or curling down of the fingers. Uh, sometimes nerve problems can. Um, so we'd need a little bit more information to know exactly right. what's going on. I, I tell you, I do see a lot of people with cramping. I mean, they cramping in their legs mostly at night, and uh, I see that in people who overexercise, and then and then they'll have leg cramps. I also see it in people who had edema, and for one reason or another, we reduced the edema. Whether we elevated the legs, whether we used support hose, or whether we gave them diuretics, but when the edema goes down. They get terrible cramping. So my first thought uh, is that maybe the person had edema or swelling, and then they got rid of the swelling, and then the cramping happened. Uh, any other comments or thoughts on that? There is an actual medical diagnosis called writer's cramp, um, which is uh, where people get contortions of the fingers. Oftentimes it's in musicians, um, artists, uh, people that are doing a lot with their hands, and oftentimes there's some trauma that starts things, and it's we don't fully understand the neural pathways that cause a contusion. It's not a not a functional problem with the hand itself, it's yeah. more a neurologic problem. And I've heard a million people talk about potassium supplements and calcium supplements and uh, magnets and the uh, whole nine yards and then there's no good answer except to say stretch those when it happens, stretch it. Yeah. Anything else? All right, we have a 67 year old woman from Sioux Falls. What's the treatment for spinal stenosis? Pete? Well, yeah, that's a great question for the hand surgeon or the shoulder surgeon. Uh, spina, <laughs> spina, <laughs> spinal stenosis is a condition where there is a inadequate room for the nerve roots as they come out of the spine or the spinal cord itself or just below where the spinal cord ends. It's basically nerve compression in the back, typically the low back, and uh, is more common in the elderly than the uh, younger population. Uh, we try to treat it non-surgically with uh, exercise, medications, sometimes injections if needed. And as a last resort, you can go in and do what's called a decompression where you remove the bone spurs, the swelling, the disc material is putting the pressure on the nerves so the nerves can wake up and hopefully do their normal function again. So, and you don't do back surgery? Neither one of us do, no, sir. I'm glad. That's a hard area. Yes. And the question is, when do you take them to surgery? So many people want back surgery. There's times when you can use it. There's times when you shouldn't be doing it. Absolutely. Tough, tough question. 
uh, 67-year-old uh, man from Sturgis uh, uh, for the hand doctor. He moved his hand wrong and it felt as if he got electrically shocked behind his knuckles. Now the back of his hand feels like he has nerve damage and he's wondering if Dr. Jones knows the cause of treatment. Yeah, I, I, numbness in the back of the hand. Yeah, so that's a little bit atypical for uh, some of the more common nerve compression uh, things like carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel. The back of the hand is supplied by a couple nerves actually. Um, so it, it certainly is possible that there's a nerve that is pinched. Uh, it might be in the neck. It though. may be in the neck though, as opposed to uh, in the hand. And the, the way that we generally uh, tease this out other than physical exam is with a nerve test called the EMG. Uh, we're able to uh, determine where the nerve is being irritated or pinched, whether it's out in the arm or the hand or up in the neck. So there's one that's in the elbow that goes down the, and it hits the last two fingers. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, that's what, uh, uh, the ulnar nerve is the name of that nerve, uh, and it runs behind the elbow. That's when you hit your funny bone, you're actually not hitting the bone, it's actually the nerve that runs right behind the bone that you're hitting. And, um, similar to carpal tunnel, uh, you develop numbness and tingling in the fingers. Um, and uh, uh, that also is a nerve that can be pinched and pinched bad enough that sometimes we have to do surgery to release the nerve. What, do you just take it out of its notch in the elbow and let it hang out there? In the yeah, that, that's a, a good question. There's debate. Uh, if you talk to 10 hand surgeons, you'll probably get 10 different opinions on that. Oh, really? Uh, uh, there's been a trend in recent years towards just releasing the nerve but leaving it in the groove. Uh, that can even be done endoscopically. Uh, in my practice, for the uh, severe uh, nerve compression, we still move the nerve uh, okay. to the front. So you, you, you're, you're in the category of moving the nerve? At times. Uh, and I think that's what that guy has. That, that Most it's, likely. It's, it's neck, uh, actually not ulnar, but I'm thinking the neck. Radiculopathy. Yeah, it's out of the neck. Yeah. And, and how often do they need surgery, the neck surgery? That's probably less common than uh, a peripheral. Again, oftentimes we start with things like epidural injections. Uh, a little steroid to the, yeah. in the neck. 67-year-old man from Sturgis, uh, oh, 68-year-old woman from Rapid City broke knee cap in four spots. It was held in place by figure eight wire and two screws. Will this need to be removed from uh, the knee cap and when and uh, how, if so? So let's go to that. Pete? Yeah, so uh, fracture of the patella, um, the big problem, uh, commonly will occur when uh, we fall on the ice uh, in the winter and land on the front of our knee and you'll put a crack right through it like this and it sometimes can break into several different pieces like it sounds like it did in this uh, person's case. Uh, in most cases, that will need to be treated surgically. If sometimes the bones don't come apart at all, they just get a clean crack through them, and the soft tissues that surround this kneecap are still intact, and they'll hold the kneecap together, and uh, you can treat the patient with a splint, and they'll heal up and do great. And but, but they don't move their knee. Right, they, they cannot move their knee for about six weeks when we do that. Now, because we haven't operated on them, they rarely get significant stiffness. Uh, but it is more likely that the, what will happen is after the fracture that they will need surgery and, uh, and we'll either use screws or pins across the fracture and then often a figure of eight wire like this person indicated she had like that. And uh, you can leave those implants in place forever. If they don't bother the patient, they don't notice them, they do not have to come out. However, in that location, it is often the case that they, they're aware of it because, as you know, there's not much padding in front of your kneecap. And they'll be aware of it, it'll be symptomatic, and we'll have to go in later to remove the pins and wires. In my practice, I like to leave them in for at least nine months. Okay, nine months. But at, then you end up getting rid of you, that, that, that uh, padded, fluid-filled bursa that people get, you know, that handmade knees. Tell me that that can happen when you leave those. Things. Yeah, so uh, the bursa sac lies between the skin. Actually, there's several of them in the knee, but the one that is most commonly uh, considered here is what we call the pre-patellar bursa, and it sits between the skin and the kneecap right in this region here. When we go in to put these fractures back together again, we usually go right through the bursa, you close the wound, the bursa reconstitute, it regrows, and you get that bursa again. And uh, it is the case that with any kind of trauma in this region, you can get extra fluid inside that bursa sac and get bursitis. Um, sometimes we'll have to aspirate that, inject it. Uh, very rarely would you need to operate on that. Okay. 
Uh, we have a 65-year-old man from Edgemont. Talk about treatment for Raynaud sy syndrome. That's a great yeah. question. So this is a uh, common problem in this part of the world where it gets cold. Uh, what this is is where when the fingers are exposed to the cold, uh, the blood vessels constrict more than they, they should, and so the fingers go white, and then as they rewarm, they uh, turn uh, uh, brighter red and purple and can be quite painful, really debilitating. Oftentimes just grabbing a uh, drink out of the uh, refrigerator causes the fingers to spasm like that. Um, it's interesting, there's uh, some good data that is emerging that uh, Botox is actually quite effective for Raynaud's. Uh, Botox oh, really? is what is injected wow. for yeah. wrinkles and uh, cosmetic uh, procedures. And sometimes uh, headaches. And sometimes headaches. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of different uh, uh, issues. But uh, uh, Botox can, can be injected uh, along the blood vessels in the, in the hands, right at the base of the fingers. And for many people, this provides good relief. Unlike Botox used for cosmetic procedures, where it needs to be repeated in three months because the effect wears off, uh, the effect seems to be more permanent uh, when wow. used for Raynaud's. Wow. Um, so there are some newer treatments. A uh, 79-year-old woman from Jefferson wondering about the uh, stem cell treatment for knee cartilage repair. Have you heard of that? Yeah, well, uh, there's uh, great hope uh, that we'll be able to use stem cells for people, adults, to regrow the cartilage inside their knee. You know, right now, after about age 14, you really can't grow any more cartilage in your knee, and, and we're all damaging the cartilage all the time every day. Uh, not ready for prime time now, and there are some... Um, maybe a less than purely ethical practitioners who will tell you they'll inject your stem cells. Uh, I think they may just be dipping into your wallet. Yeah. 70, we got about a minute and a half. Quick, one more question. 76-year-old man from Sioux Falls. What's their opinion on using pulse radio frequency emission therapy for lower lumbar deterioration? Any side effects? How effective for low back pain? Comments? Quick. Yay, nay. I don't know anything about that. Don't you know any, anything, Dan? Don't know no answer. 68-year-old woman from Brookings, difference between partial and full knee replacement. When does only the partial? I know a lot about that. Yes, yeah. tell me. <laughs> uh, so uh, partials are indicated, and people have a sort of different diagnosis called anteromedial osteoarthritis. Uh, specific findings on physical examination, x-ray, uh, if you can do a partial, it's a wonderful operation. You know, just make sure that you only do them in the people who will benefit from them. Okay. Uh, uh, 70, let's see, we've got a question about a hammer toe. Is there equivalent of a hammer toe in a hand? Uh, there, That's there a is, uh, yeah, or a mallet finger or a, a boutonniere deformity would be the equivalent. All right, and the boutonniere deformity, real quick, is a it's where the tendon pulls off the bone, and as the tendons uh, are in not in balance, the finger deforms and uh, flexes. And you get this up. this yeah. thing, and you can see a little boutonniere. Yeah. All right, well, we'll be right back after this. When you quit smoking, you get extra cash in your pocket right away. Yeah. One month and you've got 150 extra bucks you didn't have before. Quit six months and you have an extra thousand. Oh. Two grand in a year, four grand over two years, and a whopping $10,000 in five years. Nice chunk of change. So take a deep breath. You can do this. We can help. Mrs. Z, a widow of 15 years, Living alone, was reaching for something on a top cupboard, turned too fast, fell hitting her hip, and couldn't get up by herself. She lay on that cold linoleum floor for most of the night until she was finally able to crawl to a phone and call for help. In the emergency room, we saw the telltale signs of an outward turned and shortened leg, and the suspected fractured hip was confirmed on x-ray. Lifetime risk for hip fracture is 6% in men and 14% in women. After reparative surgery, 40% of people will require living in a nursing home for at least a period of time during recovery, and 50% will permanently require a walker. The risk of death following hip fracture, even with the best of care, is about 10% at one month and up to 40% at one year. In 2011, hip fractures resulted in about 30% of all U.S. hospitalizations, costing about $5 billion, an untold amount of suffering. 
Prior to the development of surgical repair for hip fracture, treatment involved six weeks of traction and bed rest with something like an 80% death rate from clots or pneumonia. Pinning the hip with ivory pins was first tried in 1899, but it was in World War II that a German surgeon began regularly using metal rods to stabilize bone fractures. From that point on, hip pinning became popular, allowing patients to stand up and start walking within days of surgery, remarkably reducing death rate following hip surgery. Presently, the surgical repair of a fractured hip involves a new artificial ball and sometimes socket, replacing the fractured hip in about a third of the cases. Pinning still works in most cases, however, and is quicker, easier, cheaper, and sometimes safer than the more invasive total hip surgery. 90% of hip fractures happen after falling, most often the result of inactivity and poor physical conditioning. Say it again, inactivity is the most powerful risk factor for hip fracture. Although advanced age, poor eyesight, blood pressure medicines, soft bones, neurologic and cardiac conditions are also risk factors, the big danger comes from a lifetime of inactivity. So physical activity and conditioning at any age hardens bones, enhances strength, helps avoid falls and fractured hips. So unless you want to end up on a cold linoleum floor someday, get out and get walking. This brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our great guests tonight, Pete Luby and David Jones, Jr. The take home message as we talk about bone health is to stress your bones through reasonable exercise to increase their strength and mass. That along with improving your core muscle strength to prevent falls will go a long way towards keeping you mobile. In other words, keep moving as much as you can to be able to keep moving as much as you need. On Call with the Prairie Doc would not be possible without the work of our wonderful student studio crew. Most of them are students here at SDSU. The semester is coming to a close and finals are about done and for many of our crew this is their last show. We sincerely thank them for their hard work and for their friendships we've made over the season. We wish them well in their lives as they move on from here. The world is going to be a pretty, in pretty good hands, I think. From all of us here at the On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there. It is viewer's choice. Call in or email your questions on any health topic as we open the doors to Ask Anything next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Welcome to On Call After Hours, where we answer the questions we weren't able to get to during the broadcast portion of the show. All of your questions are important to us, and we want to answer as many as we can for you. An 82-year-old man from Sioux Center, 10 years ago, shoulder replacement done, very successful, but in the last week or so, shoulder pops and cracks when he's moving. What causes this and what's going to happen? Uh, a lot of things could happen. Um, the worst thing could be that the uh, glenoid, the new socket, has gotten loose. That's the most common mode of failure uh, in a total shoulder replacement. Um, I encourage all my patients uh, after I've done shoulder replacement, if something changes like that, to come in and see me and get an x-ray. You can usually make the diagnosis on the x-ray. So with a shoulder replacement, we remove the ball, take that thing and get rid of it and then replace it with a new one. 
that's attached to a stem that goes down into the humerus like that. So here's our new ball here. And the other part of this is the socket. And there's a new plastic socket typically, although some of them are metal back, and they have uh, posts usually or sometimes a keel that goes into the scapula of the shoulder blade and then that's cemented into place with a special bone cement. And uh, total shoulder replacement is a great operation, but sometimes that socket can get loose and cause popping, cracking, and pain. So I'd get in and get an x-ray. Okay. Uh, we have a 77-year-old man from Elkton. What can be done to straighten out my broken pinky finger? Dave? Yeah, so if it is recently broken, it's a relatively simple problem. Pinky often, meaning the little... The, the small the, finger, yeah. Yes. So oftentimes we're able to just straighten it out and hold it with some pins that just go through the skin that stay in for a few weeks. If it was broken years ago, that becomes a little bit more complicated. And then the problem depends if, the, if it is bent through the joint because it's stiff or if it's bent through the bone. If it's, if it's through the joint, we try a variety of different splints and therapy to try to get it uh, straightened out. But again. if you can't and you had to fix it, do you yeah. fix it in this physiologic curved position? We do, yeah. So people oftentimes wonder about where their fingers should be pointing. And in general, they, they all point to a spot right on the, the base of the palm there. So some overlap is normal of the fingers. We talk about a normal finger cast. Uh, certainly if the finger is, is sticking out to the side, especially the small finger, that can get in the way and cause problems. Okay. 88-year-old uh, uh, woman from Watertown, what's causing the aching in the knees after the knee replacement and what can be done? Not uncommon for people to have still some symptoms after knee replacement. 5% of patients at a year after knee replacement surgery are not happy with their new knees, but that means 95%. 5%. Yeah, 5%. But that means 95% are very happy. Even in those 95%, though, a lot of them still have some symptoms. Uh, it can be tendonitis, it can be stiffness, uh, it can be deconditioning because they don't have the quadriceps strength that they need. Uh, I would recommend that she quickly go see her surgeon, get it evaluated. He'll probably have an answer for her. Uh, makes a point of the value of pre-surgery exercise. Tell me a bit about that. I don't think you can overestimate it, Rick. You know, uh, your segment and your discussion about orthopedics, the importance of staying active. Whenever I'm considering significant uh, uh, orth orthopedic surgery on one of my patients, we usually uh, develop a program of prehab, preoperative rehabilitation. Try and get that patient's joints and muscles in as good a shape as possible before we do the reconstruction. So I'm going to be an older guy and I want to do exercises to stay strong so that if I ever do get into trouble, I will have strength to be able to work on it. But shoulders is the biggest worry. Uh, you talked about the danger of wearing out a shoulder. What exercises should I be doing at 66? Uh, to prevent problems later on. You can break those exercises into two parts. One part is rotator cuff strengthening exercises. Therabands, uh, light dumbbells, working on internal and external rotation of the shoulder, abduction, and flexion. And the range of motion does not have to be extreme. You don't have to m take it all the way up above your head. Just work the muscle in its pain-free range of motion. Secondly, the big muscles across the shoulders, your pecs, your traps, your deltoid, your bias, your tries, your lats. And those you can do uh, in a variety of different ways, usually at a health club. They've got all the machines you need to do those. I would say in general, light weights, more reps, concentrate on range of motion, function. Don't try to look like He-Man. Okay. Like you do. Oh, wow. 71-year-old <laughs> wow. from Kyle. His left hand feels like there's sandpaper in them whenever he moves his fingers. He's wondering what causes this, and he's diabetic. It feels like sandpaper when he's moving them. Yeah, certainly with his history of being diabetic, it makes you wonder about a peripheral neuropathy where all the nerves are affected. And uh, uh, it certainly can be a, a problem where a nerve is pinched, but uh, I'd wonder about uh, whether or not it's a, more of a generalized peripheral neuropathy. What about hand exercises to prevent deterioration of my hand as I get older? I mean, do you recommend uh, anything? There, there's very little data that there are any exercises you can do in your hand to uh, uh, prevent problems. There's one small study looking at some exercises to prevent thumb arthritis. Yeah. Where you literally just push against the side of your finger to strengthen this muscle right here. Oh, really? Um, push, 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 in. push towards your thumb. Push towards your thumb. So that will help with the thumb arthritis. Helps to, it helps to stabilize the base of the thumb. The data is weak, but I tell people if you want to do something to try to prevent thumb wow. arthritis, 
push against your fingers. What about the golfer's uh, squeezer thing? Yeah, those, those are those are fine. They they keep the joints limber, um, but uh, again, no lighter weight. Uh, you don't want to do real forceful gripping because that can just increase the the force across All the right. joints. All right, 65 year old woman from Brookings after having a knee replacement. The patient had a rash develop around the incision. Rash is still present weeks after surgery. Rash after surgery. Yeah, I think it was my patient. She's calling in because yes. she's still not perfectly <laughs> happy, right? <laughs> um, usually that, that rash right around the incision is from something in the dressing that we put on there or it can be what we use to prep the skin before the surgery. Uh, in general, as soon as we can, we like to get everything off the skin, leave it open to the air, might have them use uh, over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream or another steroid cream to try and decrease the uh, rash. Uh, Benadryl orally for uh, itching, or there's a Benadryl cream they can use now too. And I would add, I like CeraVe, and the reason CeraVe is nice is because it, after you take a shower, after you wash, because oftentimes rashes are dry, too dry, too much washing, right? So you you take your shower, you put the CeraVe on top, it caps the water inside. It's sort of like zinc oxide ointment, only it's pleasant. So Sarah, capital V, or any other of the creams that have ceramide in them. Uh, what about uh, ways to reverse hammer toe? Are there exercises to reverse it? Not aware of any exercises. There is surgery that can be done. Uh, okay. To straighten surgery, toes. pretty straight forward yeah. surgery, if it's bothering you, that's the major exactly, thing. Exactly, exactly. 70-year-old woman from Rapid, uh, total uh, shoulder replacement surgery coming soon. Will I have a total recovery or will I have to exercise to get my range of motion back? How long will it take? Uh, yes, and yes. And yes, <laughs> yes you will have. Um, so we, yeah, obviously you're having the surgery because you're not happy with the current situation. We expect that the surgery will make you much better, less pain, better range of motion, better strength, better function. You definitely will have to exercise to get to where you want to go, though it's not just going to happen on its own. How long? I tell my patients who so I'm doing a shoulder replacement uh, surgery on to expect improvements for about two years. Their shoulder has been getting bad for 20 or 30 years. It's impossible that it's going to get better in two or three weeks. You're going to have to keep working on it, and you'll slowly gain range of motion, strengthening, uh, endurance, stamina. Get the shoulder back the way you want. But you want to do preoperative exercises and so get strong always. always. A 65 year old man from Wilmot, he is calling for his brother who is a Vietnam vet, 62 years old. He, they operated six times, got a bad infection. They removed his hip joint. He's not had a hip joint for five years now. The doctors are now just prescribing him pain medicines. Can something like this be repaired? Except that he doesn't have the musculature to use that hip anymore, does he? Or does he? Well, yeah, I think that's a difficult problem. Uh, infections with joint replacements uh, are one of the things that we worry about most. And um, there are times where, you know, despite everything we do, we're not able to fully clear that infection as long as there's metal in the body. So I think it's worth uh, getting another opinion to see if uh, uh, putting a hip joint back in is an option. Uh, but it sounds like he's been through this several times. That's a tough scenario. Any? We've got we've got a partner. David and I have a partner down in Sioux Falls uh, at Orthopedic Institute, uh, Dr. Uh, Corey Rothrock. Corey is a fel he's an orthopedic surgeon like we are. But he's fellowship trained in um, orthopedic oncology, which is cancer of the bones and joints. Those guys are also the experts in bone and joint infections, and there aren't a whole lot of them. He's the only one in our region. Um, this is a tough problem. Um, if this was my brother, I'd get him in to see Dr. Rothrock. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've I had great experience with Rothrock because I've seen these horrendous <laughs> cases. They all seem to gravitate to Rothrock, and he'll take them. <laughs> oh, yeah. He takes them. <laughs> he loves them. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, a uh, 71-year-old man from Sioux Falls is restless. Oh, I've got to type. Let's see. Restless leg syndrome uh, related to an orthopedic problem. Uh, so restless leg syndrome, any comments? I think it's unrelated to an orthopedic problem. It can be a uh, um, iron deficiency problem or uh, just a neurologic problem is the most common. Uh, we've got a 74-year-old uh, man from Sioux Falls related to uh, an orthopedic problem, so restless leg. That's it. All right, now I need to go to the next one, and I'm having trouble with my machine here. You tap it. 57-year-old woman from uh, Kennebec 
if I can get there. Here it is, had a cancerous wart taken off of the palm of her hand. She now has a lot of scar tissue. Would scar tissue remove, removal surgery be as painful as the wart removal, and uh, would it improve hand function? What do you think of that? Yeah, so uh, difficult to say without seeing the hand. Uh, when we hear about people with a lot of scar tissue, uh, Dupuytren's contracture is one of the things that we uh, that we think about. They are more prone to forming uh, thick scar. So uh, if she has formed thick scar once, it is certainly possible that it would come back, um, but would have to see the hand uh, to know for sure if there's uh, uh, ways okay. to improve that. 86-year-old woman uh, from uh, Brookings, a constant tingling in the tip of her fingers and random numbing of the hand. What is causing this and what can I do about it? Sounds like carpal tunnel syndrome. So the, the thing to do is to get checked out to uh, see if it, um, and don't let it go too far too long. Don't let too it go long. too long, exactly. 83 year old man from Central with knee pain when standing or walking, not at rest. What is the most likely cause of this pain? Had had minor back surgery 10 years ago, 5'11", 205 pounds. Osteoarthritis. And so what do you recommend? Uh, evaluation and treatment. And probably the treatment's going to be? Uh, you know, it depends on the, how severe the arthritis is, but almost always we start with non-surgical management, uh, medications, Physi physical therapy, home exercise program, injections if needed, surgery as a last resort. Okay. 30-year-old woman from Vermilion had trapezium implants and now is breaking down. What can I do about this? Trapezium. Yeah, so that's that's the bone at the base of the thumb. Uh, it's that's a, the one that really is, it loses its blood supply when it fractures, and then it gets that's, uh, necrosis. That's the scaphoid. Uh, oh, that's the scaphoid. Yeah, the trapezium, it, it can happen in the trapezium, but uh, more commonly that's the scaphoid. Uh, uh, trapezium implants is a work in progress. Uh, there are, are newer implants that are out, but uh, I think the, the treatment for this is uh, to remove those uh, implants, and uh, what we're doing more commonly is just using tissue from the body to uh, um, to support the thumb, and uh, so if we what is the trapezium? Here, so, so at the base of the thumb, this is uh, the trapezium right here, and this is the joint between the trapezium and the metacarpal here, where people most commonly get uh, arthritis. Uh, and so uh, there have been several different types of implants that have been uh, developed trying to develop a joint replacement for arthritis at this uh, joint. Uh, some of them were silicone, and if this was 30 years ago, my guess is that is silicone. That silicone eventually breaks down. Uh, what we do is we remove that bone in its entirety. We use a, a tendon from the forearm uh, to create a, a cushion or sling at the base of the thumb here to support the, uh, the thumb metacarpal. So it's time for her to have a surgery. Time for her to have a new surgery. Uh, 76 year old woman from Sioux Falls wakes up at night with pain in the knees and hips but doesn't occur during the day. Heat pad, pain goes away. What's causing this? This is most likely soft tissue pain, not joint pain. Uh, most common thing would be uh, iliotibial band syndrome, uh, usually treated well with physical therapy modalities. Uh, and why did she have it? Iliotibial band is where? Let me see if I can find the knee, right? The IT band or iliotibial band runs from the hip joint, so way, way, way up here, right, is the hip joint, uh, or the iliac wing above the hip joint, and the IT band runs all the way down the outside of the hip, the thigh, and comes down, actually attaches way down here on the tibia right here. It's an incredibly long structure, crosses two joints, the hip joint up here and the knee joint down here. Uh, as we age, and if, especially if we don't uh, vigorously, rigorously stretch that structure, it will tend to get tight. And as it gets tight, it will want to rub up here at the hip joint and down here at the knee and cause pain. It's usually relieved with heat and stretching um, and uh, with movement, actually. So that's why she has it at night or when she's at rest. And especially if she then changes position or gets up to go. But once it gets stretched out and warmed up, the pain goes away. All right. Uh, this, this is, the next one is an 80-year-old uh, woman. Let's see. I'm trying to get this. An 80-year-old woman from Sioux Falls, what can be done for osteoporosis? I, if I, she was my patient, I'd send her to see you. Yes. What do you do for osteoporosis? You don't get there because you've been exercising. It's, you know, 
I, I would make this point that osteoporosis is a disease of thinning of the bones. You want to make sure that that person has adequate vitamin D and that person has, doesn't have malnutrition of some kind and that person, uh, you know, if you look at an x-ray you'll see uh, the lines in the bone that, that go through the bone and we call that stress lines because they come from a lifetime of pounding on it making the bone stronger. So it's exercise or a, uh, that makes bones stronger, lack of exercise, and they get real soft. Uh, I think we have thought that there's medicines that help, and there, there are medicines that help, but they're a weak alternative to the most important thing, and that is a regular a lifetime of walking. And would you agree? Yeah, I, for me, uh, personally, and my family, I recommend uh, regular weight-bearing exercise, walking or getting in the gym and doing a little bit of weight training. Uh, make sure you've got adequate vitamin D and calcium um, intake. Uh, but uh, sometimes, Rick, you've done all those things and the patient still has profound osteoporosis. Do you have a first-line medical agent that you like to use for those patients? I, I you know, I'm, I'm in a quandary right now because the, the drugs, and there's four or five of them that you can use to make the bone stronger. Uh, but now we find that at five years, gee, they're starting to have small fractures, and so they've said stop them and give them a rest. And then they, really the answer is we don't know what we're doing with those. We don't know what we're doing with that one. There's this other one that you take an injection twice a year. Um, and it's theoretically uh, probably a reasonable option, except that it's, it's, it's a biologic. It's, it's a big time uh, thing, and uh, I'm, I haven't gotten on board with that one. So my answer is always to just keep exercising, and, and you, when you're 80 or 90, you know, exercise is important, and if you get severe osteoporosis, it's kind of what's been handed you. It's a familial deal more than anything. Yeah. Well, we're. I think we're out of questions. It was a great night. It was a fun, quick snap through the, the work, and uh, we appreciate you being here and answering your question, our questions. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for having us. Very fun. Thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all your questions and the opportunity to answer them. And until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Brookings Health System, Dakota Care, Dakota Dermatology, the Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by the generous support of Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. <laughs>